the steel case started green in 1970, actually. We didn't know what green meant at that time, but oh, we tried to improve all of the, all, everything we could uh, in the process of making furniture to, to make it safe. We had local people, we had students, and we had professors, and we had the University of Michigan and other people like that working on projects that we were trying to solve. One was air, water, uh, clean air, clean water, and uh, the proper disposal of waste. That's how we started. And uh, so people were not doing that in those days. And we didn't have the EPA at that time to really uh, say you, you can't do that anymore. You're creating all the bad stuff that has to be cleaned up. Why not do it right in the first place? So that's where we started in 1970. Do all the good you can for all the people you can for as long as you can. Just if you did that in your life, just think of what would happen. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the 21st Annual Peter M. Wege Lecture on Sustainability. I'm Lori McCauley, Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Michigan. It's wonderful to see you all here in Rackham for our first in-person Wege Lecture since the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. As we begin, I want to recognize an important part of our history, a land transfer from the indigenous people of this area. The University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan. This was offered ceremonially through the treaty at the foot of the rapids so that their children could be educated. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. Knowing where we live and work does not change the past, but understanding and acknowledging the history, culture, and impacts of colonial practices is an important step toward the creation of an equitable and sustainable future. The Wege Lecture is part of an outstanding legacy at the University of Michigan, the School for Environment and Sustainability and the Center for Sustainable Systems. I'd like to thank the School for Environment and Sustainability's Dean Jonathan Overpeck for inviting me here this evening. I would also like to thank and recognize Representative Debbie Dingle, who's here with us tonight. And I saw Debbie earlier. <laughs> Representative Dingle is an active civic and community leader, as well as a recognized national advocate for women and children. Her attendance tonight underscores the impact of climate change on some of our most vulnerable populations, especially the power that we have to shape the future when our leaders share our priorities and passions. Thank you, Representative Dingle. U of M's environmental legacy is one that begins with generations of student activists who have led the way as champions of a better, healthier and more just world. And I'm really happy to see students with us here this evening. It's also a legacy of world-class faculty who have advanced understanding of climate change and collaborated with students to create and implement solutions on our campus, in our state, in Washington, DC, and around the world. 
and it's a legacy of a powerful community whose tireless commitment to our planet gives us hope for tomorrow as we commit to real action together. Members of our community established this lecture and launched the nation's first environmental justice academic program. For the incredible work of our extended university community, I want to thank you. And as we celebrate this legacy, we must look forward to our future. Action now is more important than ever before. It's because of those in the room that I feel more optimistic than ever. This is the time when we are creating a more just, sustainable, and brighter future for all. To our partners from state and local government and community organizations, I appreciate your leadership and partnership. To the representatives from the Wege Foundation and the late Peter Wege, I commend your enduring support, not only of this lecture at the University of Michigan, but also for advancing sustainability across the state and globe. I'd especially like to acknowledge Diana Wege, who's the daughter of the late Peter Wege and James Logan, president and CEO of the Wege Foundation for joining us here this evening. To the students, faculty, staff, and partners who are helping to advance carbon neutrality at U of M, I thank you for your commitment to the difficult work it takes to solve such a complex challenge. U of M is committed to achieving university-wide carbon neutrality. We're reducing greenhouse gas emissions from purchased electricity to net zero by 2025 and eliminating direct campus emissions by 2040. We're planning geo exchange systems, pursuing campus solar installations, enacting maximum building emissions targets, and funding energy conservation projects across our campuses, all while aiming to foster a broad culture of sustainability. Following advocacy by our community, U of M also modified its natural resources investing strategy, focusing on renewable energy and pursuing a net zero endowment by 2050. Thank you. Of course, none of this would be possible without all of you in this room. We see the world's challenges as profound opportunities a renaissance of innovation lies ahead, the birth of thousands of ideas brought to life. We're redefining the future to protect people and our planet, and for that, I thank all of you. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors of this event, whose names you saw on the screen as you entered Rackham here today. And I know at least uh, one of the deans from the sponsoring units LSNA and Curzan, Dean Ann Curzan is here. So thank you for being here. And I also note that our University of Michigan Regent Sarah Hubbard is here with us as well. Thank you for being here. Your presence is really important. The supporters of this event and the audience here today represent the interdisciplinary work and collaboration across organizations that we need in order to tackle the world's most pressing environmental challenges, with climate change ranking at the top of that list. At the University of Michigan, we say bring it on, and we'll build a brighter tomorrow together today. And now, I'd like to introduce our guest of honor and speaker, President Mary Robinson. President Robinson served as President of Ireland from 1990 to 1997. She is widely regarded as a groundbreaking and transformational leader who elevated the public role of the Irish presidency, helping to shape modern Ireland in a period of rapid and unprecedented economic growth. From 1997 to 2002, 
Robinson served as United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, also transforming that office through high visi visible public advocacy. She's a founding member and currently the chair of the elders, an independent group of global leaders formed by Nelson Mandela to tackle the world's most pressing problems. She also leads the Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice. President Robinson's lecture today is very timely as we just commemorated International Women's Day last week. The theme of this year's day was embrace equity. The focus on gender equity needs to be a part of every society's DNA, and President Robinson is fighting it every single day through her foundation. Women can lead, and in many cases are leading our climate action, but they need to be better represented in climate decision making at all levels. President Robinson's foundation's work promotes women's empowerment and gender equality based on the principles of climate justice. In addition to her foundation work, President Robinson served as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy on Climate Change, sounding the alarm as extreme weather events dramatically affected the world's most vulnerable populations. She served as Vice President of the Club of Madrid, Chair and Co-Founder of the Council of Women World Leaders. She serves on numerous boards, including the European Climate Foundation, and chairs the newly formed Center for Sport and Human Rights. Since 1998, Robinson has also served as the Chancellor of the University of Dublin, Trinity College. She has taught at Trinity College and Columbia University, served in the Irish Senate for 20 years, and co-founded the Irish Center for European Law at Trinity College. Her recent book, Climate Justice, has received glowing reviews from former world leaders and the environmental and human rights community. President Barack Obama awarded her the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom and praised her as an advocate of the forgotten and ignored, noting that she has not only shown a light on human suffering, but illuminated a better future for our world. We're in for a treat. Please join me giving a warm welcome to President Mary Robinson. Thank you very much, Provost Macaulay, for those very warm words. And I'm delighted uh, to be invited to speak at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and in particular uh, to the UM School for Environment and Sustainability and the Center for Sustainable Systems. And I'd like to thank the Waggy Foundation and family for uh, ensuring that I was able to come here. Um, Listening to Provost Macaulay, I must say I feel very at home here with the uh, mission and commitments that she outlined and that she uh, spoke about. Uh, so I'm going to speak from the heart. I have notes, but basically I'm going to uh, reflect on uh, where we are in our world and what needs to be done about uh, ensuring that we can have a sustainable future. Uh, I want to start with a strange paradox, which I think many of you will also be aware of. We're on the cusp of an exciting, clean energy, fairer, healthier world, which we should all be immensely excited about and looking forward to. And yet at the same time, we are heading for a world of warming of, at best, 
2.4 degrees above, uh, Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And the scientists, the IPCC, which is very well represented here, has warned us that the whole world should stay at not above 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial standards. And I say, at best, we are heading for a 2.4 degree world, because that's if, according to Climate Action Tracker, if all governments and corporations and investment fulfilled the prejudice and prom promises that they have made. And actually, they're not doing that fully. So we're probably heading more for a 2.7 degree or maybe even three degrees Celsius world above pre-industrial standards. And, and that's catastrophic. So we're on the cusp of a clean energy world and we're heading for disaster. And yet we don't talk about it. We don't share this sense of a climate and biodiversity crisis, which is increasingly unfolding in our world. We're full of short-term preoccupations, particularly at the political level, particularly in democratic countries. Politicians have to win elections, so they are very concerned about making sure that they do so in, in, in ways that uh, make sense to them in the short term. And yet, we have this very strange paradox. I think part of the problem is a problem of communication, that we don't read about this enough in the media. We don't hear about it enough um, in our uh, everyday lives. And what we need, I believe, is to have an approach to the climate and biodiversity crisis, which is much more people-centered and which takes the position that uh, we have to realize all the positive work that is going on and make it more visible. Make it more visible so that it connects more and that we have more systems change. Um, I'm very pleased that you have a Center for Sustainable Systems. I was speaking to the dean of the center earlier and saying I'm very much a systems change person and I'm going to be emphasizing that. But we also have to, I believe, take into account the injustices of climate change. This was brought home to me after I had served as High Commissioner for Human Rights and not made fully the connection between climate change and human rights. Um, I was aware increasingly in my work as High Commissioner of the gravity of the climate uh, crisis, but another part of the UN was dealing with it. And I was in my silo, a large silo of concern for human rights and gender equality and the rights of people with disabilities, the rights of indigenous peoples, etc. And it was afterwards when I started a small organization, a small NGO called Realizing Rights, which was a sort of play on the word realizing, um, that everybody in the world should realize they have human rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights had made that clear in 1948. Um, and those with power should realize and implement those rights. And Working in African countries on the rights that really matter if you don't have them, rights to food, water, health, education, and shelter, um, I became aware, and this was in 2003, 2004, 2005, leading up to my first COP in Copenhagen in 2009, I became aware that the climate crisis was affecting the poorest countries and poorest communities and small island states and indigenous peoples much more severely and much earlier than the rest of the world, the developed world. So during my seven years as president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997, I did speak about the environment, but I didn't speak about climate. It wasn't an issue for us. And that was something that really affected me deeply. 
when I saw in these African countries, women would say to me, is God punishing us? What is happening in our world? This is beyond our experience. We so, and um, you know, a, a, a few weeks later, flooding comes when it shouldn't, or drought comes when it shouldn't. This has never happened in our experience. Um, and I became aware of the impacts of that, in particular because these were communities that weren't actually responsible for the warming that was happening, for the emissions that were contributing to human-induced um, uh, warming of our climate. And as time went on, I realized that there are various layers of injustice. That's the first one, um, the impact on the poorest countries, poorest communities, small island states, and indigenous peoples, who also happen to be, by and large, the black and brown and indigenous peoples of our world. So it's also a racial injustice. And within that, there's the gender injustice, the different social roles that women play, the different access to the table, access to decision-making, or lack of access, um, the lack of power, sometimes the lack of rights, like land rights, lack of access to credit, lack of training, and yet, very often it is women who are building resilience in their communities, who after a hurricane or a severe drought or severe flooding, band together in a women's group and help their communities to be more resilient. So there is a gender injustice, a gender dimension. Thirdly, there is the intergenerational injustice. And thankfully, school children and young climate activists have been addressing that, have been calling us out, saying, we understand the science now. We know that we're not going to have a safe future unless you, the adults, take responsibility. And of course, we're not doing enough, and they are rightly critical of us. The fourth injustice is a subtle one, but I think it's an increasingly important one. It's the injustice of the different pathways to development of different regions of the world. Developed countries, the United States, Europe, Japan, Korea, etc., we built our economies on fossil fuel. So our responsibility, of course, is to wean ourselves off what's destroying our world as quickly as possible, and to do it with just transition for the workers in coal and oil and gas, and in my own country, turf, peat. Um, but what about developing countries? I was, as you heard, the special envoy of the UN Secretary General before the Paris and at the Paris Agreement. And I was very interested in what was a new uh, development before Paris, that every country was asked to provide its um, nationally determined contribution. Um, and I was really struck by the fact that so many developing countries in their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions, wanted to go as green as possible as clean energy as possible, as quickly as possible. But of course, you need the investment up front. You need the skills, you need the training, you need the intellectual property. And after Paris, we didn't respond with you know, an immediate coming to developing countries with more support for enabling them to go green. Um, on the contrary, it's only now that we have jet peas for countries like South Africa and Indonesia, and they, where uh, certain countries, including um, the United States, have come together to provide support to get, for example, South Africa to be able to come out of its dependence on coal, to enable Indonesia similarly. Um, this should have happened much earlier, but it didn't. And developing countries have found, many of them, oil and gas and coal, and they're in a situation where they are being told, and I actually am part of telling them, that it's not in their interests to develop using fossil fuel, or using it as little as possible, uh, because they will be the most affected 
because of that injustice, that it affects them earlier and more severely because they are less um, resilient in many um, situations. So uh, there is that uh, dilemma now of uh, the fact that uh, we haven't supported enough um, developing countries to have that access to clean energy, uh, but uh, it, it is evolving. And the fifth injustice is the injustice to nature um, herself. Um, uh, the dramatic loss in biodiversity in recent years, which uh, is very striking and very worrying, and the loss of species, um, the extinction of species, and the acidification of the oceans, and so on, that you will be more than aware of. So, we need to have a sense of the fact that the richer parts of the world have benefited hugely from fossil fuel, but it's now beginning to destroy the ecosystems that sustain us. I belong to a group of business leaders called the B Team of Business Leaders. I'm not, in fact, a businesswoman. I think I'm a kind of moral conscience or something for these <laughs> business leaders. But uh, they have estimated that we spend $1.8 trillion a year on subsidies of what is destroying us, mainly fossil fuel. 1.8 trillion a year. That is what should shift dramatically to what will give us this better future. In other words, um, the clean energy and the support for just uh, transition. So I began to realize that perhaps one of the keys to how we may move forward is the extraordinary trust that exists in women's leadership in the world. Um, I say that because uh, there isn't too much trust in our world today. Um, it's actually a much more fractured world than it has been. That's of great concern to the elders that I have the honor to be chair of at the moment. We talk about uh, the problems now of multilateralism, um, the breakdown of trust, the increasing uh, sense of attention, even between the United States and China, for example, obviously the war in Ukraine and the way that that has um, aggravated um, the energy security um, issue um, in the shorter term for Europe, but um, also dramatically for developing countries in um, access to um, uh, uh, um, um, energy, but also fertilizer and food. Um, so this trust of women leaders um, is a remarkable um, value at the moment in our world because it exists at all different levels. It exists at grassroots and indigenous community level, at women's networks, networking, and even women um, at higher political levels. And a few years ago, after I had written my book on climate justice, I was still a little bit, uh, not a little bit, very worried about the fact that we still weren't communicating well the uh, climate issue. So I got involved in a podcast um, actually, I wanted to make a documentary, and I was referred to um, experts on documentary called Doc Society. And I was told, no, a documentary takes a bit long. Um, you're not probably the best person anyway to do it. No, no forget that. Um, think about a podcast. And being an elder, I had to ask the question, what's a podcast? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got over that problem. And they said, leave it with, with us. And they came back to me a few weeks later and they said, we think we've got somebody who can um, be a very good person to do the podcast with you. She's a comedian. And I went, comedian? Um, and she's Irish. Um, and it turned out to be a, a great success because Maeve Higgins is the name of the comedian. She's based in New York. She's a, a very funny comedian, but she's also very, she has a very strong social conscience she didn't know anything much about climate. And she was eight years old when I was elected president. And 
part of her humor is to be half respectful of me, which of course <laughs> goes down very well in Ireland, needless to say, but it seems to have a wider, have a wider impact. And we were using humor a lot to um, interview on our podcast um, women of the global south and women of the south of the United States. We've done three sessions and we're about to start another session of Mothers of Invention. But our byline was a bit provocative because it said that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. And uh, this was... <laughs> This was sort of in the back of my mind last April when I was meeting again with one of the women's networks that I belong to called Connected Women Leaders. And these are women um, who are uh, very much um, in the communications and media world, um, which is not my world, to be, to be honest. I don't have a social media following. I'm not, um, I'm, not, I'm, not I'm, I'm, I'm an elder. Anyway. <laughs> uh, but I had already had a lot of contact, and we had um, linked the commitments of Connected Women Leaders, which was food security, health issues, and climate change, into recognizing the intersectionality of all of those, especially when you talk about climate justice. So they had become very aware of uh, the need for a climate justice approach. And when we met last April, I just became more urgent because I do feel that urgency of the crisis. And I started to talk about uh, John F. Kennedy and the moonshot because we were having the um, anniversary of the moonshot. And um, the more I talked about the fact that he said that the United States would put a man on the moon and it happened in eight years, the more I got a kind of pushback that this was actually quite male and technical and competitive against Russia and uh, you know, uh, not exactly. So they said to me, um, you know, come back to us with a feminist earth shot and then we'll listen to you. Um, and gradually uh, we evolved what we now call Project Dandelion. Project Dandelion had its soft launch in London two days ago. And I'm happy to say that at the end of our discussion of it, with a number of our women leaders, um, uh, Pat Mitchell, myself, um, Hindu Omara Ibrahim, who's um, indigenous from Chad in Africa, and um, Hafsat Abiola from Nigeria. We four were the key women, but we also had three other indigenous um, panelists um, who joined us. So we were a kind of good range of inclusive women um, speaking about Project uh, Dandelion. Um, the dandelion, I have learned, is a flower weed that grows on all seven continents. It's very resilient. Um, if you ever try to get rid of it from your lawn or your front, um, it's, 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 it's very hard. Um, it's also used by some farmers to re, um, uh, um, sort of, um, uh, Re readdress the soil, re rejuvenate the soil, if you like. Um, it's, 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 it's good from that point of view. Poets write about it, and um, it uh, uh, is used in soups and in teas in some cultures. So it had that very um, good nature-based uh, feel about it as a symbol. And how do you spread it? You just blow. Children blow the dandelion seeds. So <clears throat> this appealed to us um, as women leaders that we would have a women-led, but not women-only um, approach that would be um, a movement to address the crisis that we're in, the climate and biodiversity crisis. And how would we address that crisis? In two ways we would make very visible the work that was going on at all levels, um, by a lot of women, but also by men, um, uh, and, and by young people. Um, women um, in, in um, making communities more resilient, in being innovative, um, in 
the work of um, uh, progressive business, the work of philanthropy, um, uh, the work of indigenous communities, uh, and then by making it more visible, we would have a systems change approach um, to ensure that we made connections that grew the way of doing, that connected and learned across, that spread examples, spread the dandelion seed examples through that visibility. And because we were a climate justice movement that we want to build, we would also uh, insist on what I would, I would say is the hard side, um, which not all women leaders will do, but um, there are many of us who are prepared to do it. And that is to say that governments must stop subsidizing fossil fuel and must... And, and that we are in favor of windfall taxes for excessive um, profits from fossil fuel at the moment. That, that we want to make real the loss and damage fund, which was agreed at COP27 um, in Egypt, and do it linked with monetary reform, the uh, initiatives like the Bridgetown Initiative of Prime Minister Mia Motley um, uh, of Barbados, um, to enlarge greatly the uh, resources uh, which would be available. That we must learn from indigenous communities and uh, make sure that clean energy projects respect human rights. Um, I've learned that that's also a problem, that some clean energy projects are mega projects that come in from the outside, ignore local communities and their rights, their land rights or their water rights, and um, often uh, have a major either dam or um, a major uh, solar energy project, which um, uh, are, are, in the case of Kenya, a big wind farm project which initially ignored the Maasai people um, in Kenya, um, who actually were the pastoralists that used that land, but they weren't regarded as having land rights of any kind. And all of these issues are very real. <clears throat> we have to ensure that uh, the way of doing um, is one that uh, respects, uh, respects human rights. And what we want to do is to build an unstoppable, women-led, but as I say, not women only, uh, movement um, that is very optimistic. It's the movement that recognizes that paradox that I spoke about at the beginning, that we're on the cusp of a clean energy world and demands that we get that world, wants to talk about that world, wants to hurry towards that world, wants to have uh, great faith in the fact that we can um, have a very livable world once uh, we have um, moved the investment into um, what is going to provide uh, energy. For example, um, in, on the continent of Africa, to the 600 million people who never switched the switch for electricity, or the 900 million who still cook on dirty cook stoves, dirty on coal and um, uh, uh, charcoal and um, animal dung and inhale um, uh, the um, uh, indoor and outdoor uh, fumes. Um, and of course the fumes of fossil fuel um, uh, and, and the part, part, particulate matter uh, kills about 9 million people a year, which is more than uh, HIV and COVID, etc. Um, in, in, in any given year. Um, and yet we don't read about that much, we don't hear about it much. So um, we have this sense of uh, a movement that uh, will take um, its spirit from what one of the connected women leaders, an indigenous woman from this country, um, Jade Biko, she may be known to some of you. Jade has her own climate justice in New Mexico and is quite a leader in this country um, on climate justice. And she said to us, in our tribe in New Mexico, we have a saying, what if our best times are, are ahead of us? What if our best times are ahead of us? And the truth is they are, but we have to get there. And that's the, that's the key. We actually just have to get there by switching. And we have to have the pressure, an unstoppable pressure. 
and systems change feeding that pressure in order that we can do the impossible. Um, I said to the students earlier, and I believe it, and I'll finish on this, I believe that the next seven years, the seven years to 2030, are probably the most important years in human history. Because either we will do the impossible and cut those emissions by 45 to 50% globally and get on track for being net zero by 2050, or if we don't, it makes it so much more difficult to do that. Um, some scientists say virtually impossible. We're already at whereas 1.1 to 1.2. So we're facing something that seems to be impossible. And that's where the earth shot comes in. That's where the women-led comes in. That's where doing the impossible comes in. And as Nelson Mandela put it very succinctly, it always seems impossible until it is done. And we just got to do it. And women are going to lead on it. Thank you. That was awesome. Let's do the impossible. How about it? <laughs> well, I have a whole new view on dandelions in my yard. <laughs> so we're going to begin the Q&A portion, which includes questions that we've received from the audience in advance of today's program. So I'll start with uh, a question that says, you've been quoted as saying, we are the first generation to understand how serious the climate crisis is, and the last generation to be able to do something about it. So, you know, we clearly have this urgent need for action. And the question is, have you seen positive signs for addressing climate change from world leaders? And if so, do you have examples? <laughs> it's, uh, it, you know, it's a good question because I've been involved, obviously, in politics in Ireland, um, and I know how difficult it can be to take decisions that are more catering for that long-term, and it's not so long-term anymore, problem of the climate and biodiversity crisis. And frankly, even uh, you know, leaders who say they understand the climate problem still find it very difficult. Let me give you an illustration from today. The decision about the willow oil field in Alaska. You know, um, that is a very bad decision for the, for the future of humankind, but it's a good decision for jobs in Alaska. And it's possibly a decision because of the court si system in this country that if it didn't happen, would lead to serious litigation. Maybe the courts would decide that litigation in favor of a willow oil field, but it's a very bad decision for humanity, yeah. for the future of our world, because uh, we cannot afford, and the International Energy Agency has made it very clear, we should not be opening up new oil and gas fields. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as president, you were focused on being a unifying force for the people of Ireland. What are some of the lessons learned that can be applied to addressing the human rights issues that come with climate change, such as making just transitions to clean energy? Yeah, I think um, just transition is extraordinarily important, and we don't think or talk about it enough. Um, it requires very significant resources. And it requires very significant talking to the people that you want to persuade to move in that transition. Mm -hmm. um, whether, that, whether we're talking about uh, the owners of um, you know, coal, oil, gas, or the workers, um, both need to be involved in uh, an understanding of the need for a, for a just transition and uh, to be part of the solution. And 
That's why I mentioned the JetP initiatives now for countries like South Africa, which is 90% dependent on coal um, and huge problems with their coal with huge um, um, uh, load shedding uh, problems. <laughs> but uh, you know, the eight billion uh, was committed in Glasgow, but that actually needs a huge um, private sector, um, actually, you know, not just billions, but maybe trillions, <coughs> in, um, ultimately. Um, and similarly, Indonesia, and now Vietnam, and probably other countries in Africa will get that kind of support. But here in the United States, um, you know, it, it's interesting that um, I, I've seen, a, you know, an analysis of red states, so-called, um, moving much faster into clean energy, which is interesting. Um, I, I, I hope it's being done with full just transition for the workers. <clears throat> There's another question about uh, Ireland, and this was submitted by a C student who asks, hi, Mary. <laughs> As an Irish person studying environmental justice here, it feels very special and coincidental to have you speaking here today. As it regards Ireland, what do you think the biggest climate or environmental justice challenges are facing Ireland today? Well, before I answer the question, I have to say everybody in Ireland calls me Mary, so no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, the biggest problem, I would say, is probably uh, in the area of agriculture. You know, we're still a country with a large agricultural sector by European standards, a very important one, for, especially for um, political decision making. And uh, we now have very strict climate legislation, I'm glad to say, and it's legal, so it will be enforced by the courts, and our courts will enforce it. And it requires every sector to achieve certain um, reductions in emissions. And so far, the toughest sector is agriculture um, to persuade. And there's kind of a little bit of a, uh, I would say, a sort of backlash of farmers who say, you know, um, we're, we've always been concerned about the environment. And um, Irish cattle, because they're fed on grass, are terrific cattle, and much better cattle than any other cattle in the world. Why should we <laughs> have to reduce our herd or even think about it? So, you know, there's a, there's a real resistance. And again, I doubt if there's enough dis discussion. You know, there has to be um, a really intensive, um, supportive dialogue going on. Um, uh, you know, we're in a crisis, you know. <laughs> a climate and biodiversity crisis. I know that here in this university, you're very well aware of this, but it isn't talked enough about, and you don't see it in the media. You don't hear it. Uh, we don't talk about it. Um, uh, Catherine Hayhoe is a very good climate scientist in this country, and she's written a book called Saving Us, and it's all about talking about what's affecting us. Mm -hmm. So I think every sector needs to be part of a discussion that brings solutions for them, and that includes the farming yeah. um, and so agricultural sector now. How do you talk to the farmers? How yeah, do you I talk think, to yeah, I think people in rural yeah, communities? Yeah, I, I think you talk to them by moving with them, um, but explaining that uh, the science is clear, and we have to, uh, you know, address across the board reduction of emissions. I think our legislation is very fair, including fair to the agricultural sector. Some people would say it's actually getting off lighter than transport or other sectors. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, you know, we, we just need to uh, genuinely, um, you know, do it very respectfully because farmers do have a very strong sense of the land and of, you know, being environmentalists, um, of caring, and they do care. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a case of moving um, by explaining more um, the inevitability of, um, you know, meeting the science targets. Mm -hmm. And syncing <clears throat> up with their foundations. Yes, and, so and, speak, you know, and, yeah. and, and giving credit for what they're doing. Yeah. And, and also younger farmers tend to be much more, um, you know, Receptive. prepared to, yeah. to move in the right direction. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the next question was submitted by Justin Schott, who is the product, 
project manager of U of M's energy equity project. He asks, when people raise climate change as an issue of life or death, they're often framed as extremists or idealistic activists who are unwilling to compromise. How can we keep the threat to survival front and center while also pushing realistic policy solutions and securing positions at decision-making tables? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting um, question and point because it's one that we've discussed a lot in this Connected Women Leaders as we were preparing our project Dandelion. And we made it, you know, we, we, we were really convinced we have to be on the side of the optimism of solutions in order to bring people with us, in order to bring hope. But it has to be an optimism that's based on an understanding that by um, mapping and making visible a whole range of solutions from what's happening in communities, grassroots and indigenous communities, what's happening with entrepreneurs, what's happening with business on the progressive side, what's happening with philanthropy, and bring together, for example, um, I see it already in the fashion world. Um, there's a real sector approach now to slow fashion, uh, which is growing. It's probably not enough, but it's encouraging people like me. I'm a jackets person. I'm, I'm slow now to buy new jackets. I just put them away for a year or two, and fortunately I haven't changed size. So, and then they come out as new, you know. <laughs> and, you know and, and, and similarly, um, I'm learning about the film world, for example. Um, the Green the Deal and the Green Shoots are two different initiatives to make the whole film industry more aware of its carbon footprint. I think. And these are all examples. If you, if you, if you have a systems approach, and I know your Center for Sustainable Systems would probably say this much more eloquently than I'm doing, but I am aware that this is what's going to make the difference. So what we're saying is, as women, we're going to be talking about um, this exciting world that we're on the cusp of. We're nearly there. But, <laughs> and then some of us will take on the harder stuff with the B team of business leaders and others to um, stop um, investment in what is harming us and shift it, et cetera, and also make sure that the clean energy uh, respects human rights because that is, that is an increasing problem. That um, it's a new industry, it's making quite a lot of mistakes. Um, we need it, we need it very badly, but it has to respect human rights. And for anybody who wonders why I'm saying that, just go to the um, website of the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. And you'll see there lots of examples of clean energy not respecting human rights and causing a lot of problems. So, you know, it's something we absolutely need, but it has to, has to do it right. Yes, thank you. Here's another question. Uh, do you think governments can actively take action for sustainability under a capitalist system? If so, how can we assure action? And if not, how should people act? Yeah, I hear this a lot, um, particularly from young people, you know, that the system is broken, the capitalist system is broken. I actually um, have read recently um, a book that I feel cracked this very well, certainly from my point of view. It's a report of the Club of Rome, a report to the Club of Rome by a number of different um, authors whom I respect, Johan Rockström, um, climate scientist, um, uh, Sandrine uh, Dixon de Klerk, who's part of the club, uh, she's co-chair of the uh, Club of Rome, and a number of others um, uh, um, uh, good scholars. And uh, it's called Earth for All. I'm sure some of you will have read it. Um, Earth for All looks very holistically um, at the planetary boundaries, but also at the donut economics um, and the need for much more um, emphasis um, on well-being by governments and identifies countries that are doing this. Scotland, New Zealand, Australia, under its new administration, and in Europe, increasing discussion about uh, you know, 
framing the GDP more around well-being. GDP is not a good indicator at the moment. It's, it's, it's very crude. Um, and I don't know why we've um, been satisfied for so long with it. Um, so um, I'm inclined not to throw out everything and say, you know, we have to, uh, because I think that can be very destructive. Um, I think it's more a case of uh, harnessing our system for the well-being of people um, as being a, a, a major value. And then you come to, um, uh, you know, providing potential um, minimum income for people and, and all kinds of ideas of that kind. So I know you spoke with students today and you maybe you already um, answered this question with them, but for our audience, what advice would you offer to students who are working on building careers in justice, sustainability, leadership? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think that this is um, exactly what uh, is the most exciting area for students uh, because you are studying uh, the, uh, the problems that face us. We absolutely need innovation. We need systems thinking. Um, we need lawyers who will take court cases. I mean, the number of cases, the litigation that is um, pending or has already succeeded. Um, uh, you know, if you look at European countries, we've had a case in Ireland, a constitutional case, that had the Irish government having to do more. They've had the same thing. The Netherlands case was the, the Uganda case was the first one. Um, but uh, in France, they've had litigation. In Germany, they've had very important litigation. Um, the uh, Court of Human Rights um, in um, Europe, which is based in Strasbourg, is about to have a hearing of two different cases. Uh, one involves grandmothers in Switzerland who've taken a case, and the other uh, is, I think it's a, a, um, a, um, a case in, is it Sweden? Uh, anyway, and, and they've joined those cases in their chamber, and they'll be giving, um, uh, they'll be having a hearing on it. Um, uh, I know there's litigation that has been trying here in the United States. Um, I, I feel, uh, you know, I feel sad to have to say that I think there is less trust in the court system in the United States necessarily giving the right decisions than there is in lots of other parts of the world. And, you know, that's a sad thing to have to say, but it, it happens to be a, a reality of the moment. Yeah. So, uh, when Vice President Harris was here in January, she commented on how people all across campus can be making an impact. And so I'm wondering if you would, you know, answer that question about really the rest of us in the audience, you know, maybe not students who are just focused in this space. What ways can we, what are the things that we can do to make an impact on a, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. Well, what I, often say to audiences, but again, I think you're a, uh, a more informed and more specialist audience because of, of what um, is, is being studied here. Uh, but what I say to a general audience, which I quite often speak to, who aren't at all uh, knowledgeable on climate and sustainability, I say, you know, everybody should make the climate crisis personal in their lives. And you know you're doing that if you um, you know, have committed to doing something you weren't doing before to make your own carbon footprint um, more responsible, um, whether it's how you move around or whether it's your diet or whatever it is. Um, and when you do that, um, you somehow have the confidence, well, I've done my bit, or you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it and I will increasingly do my bit. And then you can feel you're, you're part of the solution, if I could put it that way. And, um, I also think the most important thing we need to do is not just to imagine, but to, uh, you know, make real in our imagination this world we need to be hurrying towards. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, our best times are ahead of us. We have to get there. And what does it take to get there? And this is why, as I say, Project Dandelion is going to become, I hope, um, a kind of... Um, very light touch platform because after all we're talking dandelion we're talking um, but it's going to be communicating that sense 
that we are on the cusp of a very exciting, much healthier, much fairer clean energy world. It's around the nearest corner, but there's a pull in the other direction, which is very strong, and we have to pull it back, you know, get the investment to change, and that will only happen if politicians feel the pressure. Um, I can assure you, that's what politicians need to do. They need to feel the pressure, and then they will, you know, um, it's hard in a democracy to take hard decisions, but if you feel that people are really behind you because they really want this world, then I think that, that seems to me to be um, the way to get the decisions that we need and that we're entitled to, if I could put it that way, um, because uh, we have to uh, you know, be intelligent human beings and make sure that uh, we do enough in the next seven years, these vital years up to 2030, to give us a sustainable world for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. It's a, it's a visioning of our future. Yeah, absolutely, right? and, 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 and it's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's doing it in a way that really says, um, I urgently want this, yeah. and I urgently you know, feel passionately it's there. And, to, and actually, a lot of me, you know, because I see at these COPs, I see the climate action track, which doesn't get much visibility. It's the delegates negotiations, which are not very productive often, that get the uh, news. But on the climate action tracks, there's so much going on, there's so much collaboration, there's so much... And in fact, governments are working together in ways they weren't before. Mm -hmm. um, I co-chaired with the head of sustainability, Damalola, um, the head of the UN Sustainability for All. We co-chaired a meeting of European and African ministers of environment, and some of them were foreign affairs thing, at the COP, who were talking about how um, European and African um, uh, governments should work more closely, the JETP approach. And I think you know, that, that's relatively new, extremely important, and we need far more of that. We need, um, you know, and, and so I would say, you know, those of you who've been through the Center for Sustainable Systems, go out there and change the systems, change the world, because that's what we need. Um, it's as simple as that. Thank you so much. <laughs> I just love the optimism that you have. Thank you, President Robinson, and thanks again to the audience for your participation, your dedication, and for doing the impossible together. So, again, another... I have to share just one other um, saying that I learned from another boss of mine um, when I was UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Kofi Annan. Um, he was chair of the elders before um, I took over after his death in August 2018. And he used to say very often, and I loved the saying, and he would say it to young people all the time, you are never too young to lead, and you are never too old to learn. That applies to both of us. <laughs> Bravo, thank you.